Welcome and thank you for joining us for today's National Alzheimer's and Dementia Resource Center webinar series, sponsored by the Administration for Community Living and hosted by the American Society on Aging. My name is Julia Burroughs. I am the Program Coordinator with ASA and we are glad to have you with us. We will be getting started in just a moment, but before we do, we have a few housekeeping things. The slides for today's presentation are available under the tab on your screen labeled Resources. You will also see a tab labeled CE Application here. You'll find the information on how to obtain CE credit for this event. You have 60 days to complete a continuing education application, and it may take up to 30 days from the date of your application for us to process and issue your CE credit. If you are not logged into this webinar directly, that is, if you're watching as part of a group and did not log in using an individualized confirmation URL, you will not be eligible for continuing education credit because we have no way of tracking your online attendance. You would need to register using your own email address and then watch via that confirma confirmation URL. If you have any questions during today's presentation, you can send those to us at any time using the questions box and we'll save the last 10 to 15 minutes of today's programs to answer those. I would now like to welcome and turn it over to Sari Schumann of the National Alzheimer's and Dementia Resource Center. Thank you so much, Julia, and thank you everyone for joining us today for the National Alzheimer's and Dementia Resource Center webinar, Beyond One Size Fits All, Addressing the Needs of People Living with Dementia and Their Caregivers in Asian American and Persian American Communities. The National Alzheimer's and Dementia Resource Center webinar series is supported by the Administration for Community Living. Before we start the presentation, Erin Long of the Administration for Community Living will provide a brief welcome. Hi everyone, thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedules to join us for our very important webinar today on serving Asian American and Persian American communities. We're uh, very proud to have um, Sarah and Amy's organizations in um, ACL Alzheimer's Disease Pro <clears throat> Programs Initiative Grant Program and are excited to learn with you about um, all of the great work that they're doing. Thanks so, again so much and um, back to you, Sari. Thank you, Erin. Today's presenters are Amy Phillips and Sarah Kachanak. Amy Phillips is the Director of Program Administration at the Little Tokyo Service Center, a nonprofit social services and community development agency in Los Angeles, California. She has more than 20 years experience providing services, particularly to older adults and those with low income, starting with her roots as a bilingual case manager, then as Little Tokyo Service Center's Director of Senior Services and co-chair of the Asian and Pacific Islander Older Adults Task Force. Sarah Kachina is the Program Director and Program Manager of the Orange County Initiative to support special populations impacted by Alzheimer's disease and related disorders grant funded through the Administration for Community Living. Sarah is also an Associate Marriage and Family Therapist with a Master's Degree in Marriage and Family Therapy. She has more than 12 years of clinical experience working with diverse populations of immigrant families, specifically older adults. I will turn the presentation over now to Amy and Sarah, and Amy will start us off. Thank you. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I want to thank ASA, ACL, and NADRC for uh, allowing us to share about our communities and the programs that we're adapting for the Asian American and Persian American communities. Um, so just a little bit about Little Tokyo Service Center. Uh, well, actually, let me start with our learning objectives. Um, you know, we hope today, uh, for my part of the presentation, I'd like to share um, the diversity of Asian American communities and to try to identify some of the common barriers that Asian Americans face um, as, we, as people try to seek services in general, but um, especially with um, dementia-specific services. And you know, we hope that you pick up some points for consideration when adapting dementia services for Asian American populations. And of course, we want to talk a little bit about, about approaches to increase access and care. So Little Tokyo Service Center has been around for over 40 years. 
um, and we have different levels of services that we focus on, individual and families, also at the neighborhood level, and uh, much broader as we uh, try to pre uh, preserve the cultural heritage and um, add to the colorful, uh, rich history of the Los Angeles area in particular. And we, um, we started off in the Little Tokyo neighborhood of downtown Los Angeles, but we go all over Los Angeles County, wherever there is a, a language or cultural need. And that's true for our social services, where we do a lot of outreach and education, um, but also case management and counseling services. We serve all ages. Um, we have programs for children and families and um, parenting groups. Um, and we go all the way up to older adults and caregivers as well. And we provide our services in English and Japanese originally, but as our neighborhood has changed and as the needs around us have changed, we also have social workers who speak Korean, Cantonese, uh, Mandarin, and Spanish. Um, other things that Little Tokyo Service Center does include community development, in particular affordable housing, which is just an ongoing issue. Um, historic preservation and community spaces, and child development and even small business development, which has been a very big need in our communities uh, during the pandemic. So I want to share a little bit about demographic trends um, in the, in the um, Asian American community. And for the last two census um, well, the, the 2010 census and the 2020 census, and we've seen data show that Asian Americans are actually the fastest growing racial group in the country. And that doesn't mean it's the largest minority group, but it is the fastest growing. And the majority of Asian Americans um, are immigrants. Um, more than 60%, in fact, are, um, have immigrated to the, to the United States. And for a long time, Japanese uh, were the only Asian ethnic group that were majority American born. Um, actually, I've seen some data that shows that the Hmong community is now very slightly majority Asian uh, American born. But even in the Japanese American community, nearly a quarter report having a hard time with English. Um, and there, there are still more than a third of the Japanese American households where they speak more than one language in the household. So, you know, when we think about the Asian American community, I, we don't have time to go into the whole history of Asian immigration to the U.S., but um, I think it's important to realize that many, especially older adults, um, really are monolingual or have a very difficult time with English um, even today. I think there's a perception or image of um, Asian Americans tending to be very well educated and things like that, which is true for some Asian um, ethnic groups, but even, even still, <laughs> the majority of the population um, does have um, you know, a hard time with English. And this category of Asian American is very, very broad. It's increasingly diverse. Um, there are uh, more than 20 different countries that the Census Bureau recognizes uh, as uh, countries of origin and you know, there are more than 30 languages, um, and even more if you include the very distinct dialects. So even within the same country, um, people may not communicate the same way. Um, and then when they come to the U.S., they may have different backgrounds, different um, cultural practices that they bring with them. And then also we're seeing um, a lot of intermarriage as well, so that the, the community or a lot of times we think of ourselves as Asian American communities, plural, um, may have a lot of similarities, but is also increasingly um, diverse. And um, in Los Angeles County, we have some data that's specific to older adults. Um, we were fortunately um, able to work with AARP, which funded a study um, that was uh, done by uh, Asian Americans Advancing Justice and we looked at uh, older adults in the LA area and more than 15% are of Asian ancestry. 
And in fact, we found, you know, when we disaggregate the data, we, we found some very specific characteristics. For example, um, we looked at the poverty rates of older adults in Los Angeles County and looked at and broke it down. We found that Koreans have the highest um, poverty rate of all ethnic groups in LA County, followed by Cambodian. And in the Korean American and Cambodian American communities, um, you know, I think people um, don't really think, again, of Asian Americans as having those kinds of economic challenges, um, but in fact, it is the highest rate of poverty. And then number four was um, Chinese, and I think number five was Vietnamese. So of the top five ethnic groups, uh, racial and ethnic groups um, um, with the highest poverty rates, four of the five were Asian populations. And then for the Japanese American community, um, it kind of is similar. We see something that's similar to uh, Japan itself, where uh, the average age of the Japanese American population in LA County, actually in all of the nation, is the oldest average age. And in fact, one in five um, people in the Japanese American community are over the age of 65. So we, um, for the populations that we, Little Tokyo Service Center, serves, um, you know, we have some challenges in terms of just uh, poverty and economic security, and then just the sheer number of older adults in our population. So it's already challenging to support um, older loved ones without extended family around. If you're an immigrant community, you may not have all of your family living right next to you because you've immigrated and also your family may be in the country of origin. And, um, you know, when you add in Alzheimer's disease or other related dementias, taking care of our older adults may sometimes feel like this, right? <laughs> that we're caring for our elders who we love and respect, and it may feel like there's not a lot of resources around in order to do that. So some challenges for Asian Americans um, for, for accessing services, that diversity of language and culture and history um, can be a big issue. Um, not just getting the services we need in a particular language, uh, but even this concept of Asian American, it's really a political term, especially for our older adults. Um, they didn't come to the US with a Pan-Asian identity. They think of themselves even now as, you know, Korean or Korean American or Japanese or Japanese American or Chinese and Chinese American or more specific to their region even. Um, and so, you know, when they came to the United States, not only did they become American, they also became Asian um, because in a lot of ways um, in the US, we kind of lump all the Asian <laughs> ethnicities together. I have, unfortunately, um, in my 20, over 20 years of experience um, serving Asian Americans, um, have talked to service providers, funders, and even um, you know, uh, people from government agencies who say, oh, does your staff speak Asian? Do you speak Asian? And I'm going, gosh, there's no Asian language. There are many Asian languages. So you know, I'm always responding saying, oh, yes, we, we have staff who speak many different Asian languages. Um, and I think that's a conception that's very hard for um, our older adults in particular to have to explain, oh, you know, I, I um, have a very specific language need or, you know, they feel very um, invisible because they're not understood. And so our populations are often considered hard to reach and are underserved. Um, there are those linguistic and cultural barriers. It's just hard to find resources available in the languages that they're most proficient in. Um, and there aren't a lot of resources um, or even flyers and things to tell us about the local senior center or meal programs or things like that um, in, in the languages that, that we need. And then there are also cultural barriers like just the stigma of asking for help. And I think that's true across many different um, ethnicities. It's not unique to um, Asian American communities, but 
there is a very strong sense of keeping things within the family. Um, and sometimes, uh, it, sometimes it's overemphasized, but there is definitely a sense of shame in having to ask for help. Uh, another issue um, that we see a lot um, is that mainstream providers might not be aware of the very specific needs um, that are in the community. Um, and this is not a knock on our, our colleagues who are uh, serving in you know, the field of aging, but I think there, there are times when our neighborhoods change around us. Um, that's true for us as well, even in little Tokyo. Um, the neighborhood around us changes and um, you know, we have to make adjustments for those changes, but that can be really hard and there aren't always enough resources to, um, to even uh, to, to pick up on some of those changes, let alone change our services to, to meet them. And so a lot of times we hear from um, Asian American seniors and caregivers trying to access services saying, you know, I, I feel very invisible. And, um, and actually there, there are times, I think, when um, maybe service providers might imply that that culture, um, the cultural difference is a barrier um, and that it's maybe the senior's own fault for not being more proactive and letting go of their, their culture. And, you know, I really want to emphasize culture as sort of a tool that we use to understand and interpret the behavior of others in our everyday lives. Um, and it helps us to determine how we're supposed to respond, right? So, I, you know, when we think of culture as a tool, you have, say, like, a hammer and a screwdriver, right? And we might have a specific bias that says the hammer is always the best tool for, um, you know, getting the nail into, into a board and keeping the two boards together. Um, but there might be another kind of tool, like a screw and a screwdriver, right? And um, in, a, in a different context, a screwdriver might be more appropriate than using a hammer. Um, but sometimes I hear comments that imply that um, a screwdriver shouldn't exist, doesn't exist or shouldn't exist. And I think for a lot of Asian Americans or um, ethnic minority communities in general, there's a lot of, I think you might hear the term code switching where we have to learn to use the hammer and the screwdriver. And I think that that's a very useful thing for all service providers to have to really think about as we go forward and planning um, services and thinking about how we can increase access for our increasingly diverse communities. Um, so I wanna give an example um, where I think sometimes we might inadvertently exclude without realizing that we're doing it. So maybe in a senior center, here are some things that in a traditional senior center would be very um, like innocuous. It's common, right? We have a macaroni and cheese might be something we serve at lunchtime or a meatloaf or maybe one of the popular games might be bingo. Um, but a lot of Asian Americans are lactose intolerant. They'll see the mac and cheese and think, I really can't eat that. So that's out for them. Or maybe something like um, meatloaf, right? Um, for some that might be considered um, haram, right? If you're Muslim, uh, which is basically for a lot of Muslims, you need to have, for all Muslims, I should say practicing Muslims, they need, um, the food to be halal, which is kind of like the Muslim equivalent to kosher, if you're familiar with that. The food must be prepared a certain way in order to be able to eat it. Or if you're a vegetarian, as many Buddhists or Hindu are, then you can't eat meatloaf, right? So then that's out. Or even something like bingo, which you think is kind of universal. Um, in some cultures, it might be considered gambling. And so that's out. So there are all these things that we think of, you know, that are everyday things that we think are totally non-controversial, but it might inadvertently be signaling to um, certain cultures or older adults that they're not welcome, or this is the place that um, um, 
you know, that is in inaccessible to them. They may be totally aware of the senior center, but see what's there and say, oh, this is not for me. I can't participate or I can't access this resource. Um, you know, and it, and it might be totally unintentional and unconscious. So even the things that we think of as very normal and non-controversial, we might need to re-examine when we are planning and preparing um, services that are accessible to others. Um, I just want to briefly touch on another issue that's really come up in the last two years, the anti-Asian sentiments, especially um, during uh, COVID. Um, and in Little Tokyo, there's one senior apartment, in Little Tokyo Towers, where about 500 residents, um, mostly Korean from Japanese and Chinese, live. And right next door is um, a Japanese Buddhist temple, Higashi Hongaji Temple. And, um, Last February, at the time I prepared this slide, it was still the most recent February. But yeah, so last year, February, it was, it was vandalized. And I think for the seniors, it was just shocking to see that somebody set fire and knocked over things. And we've had instances in Little Tokyo where some of our seniors were pushed down or yelled at or spat at and things. And, you know, it creates a sense of, of fear and um, makes it that much harder to seek services. Um, so, you know, continuing on this, this theme of challenges, um, because there are fewer educational materials, fewer activities, and fewer, fewer referral resources, um, you know, it does affect the, the well-being of, of the seniors that we're trying to serve. And, we know that culturally specific resources are um, are helpful and are protective factors for memory. Um, there was a study done in the Seattle area, Japanese American community known as the Kame study. Kame means turtle in Japanese. And they found that the Jap Japanese Americans who participated in culturally appropriate or um, uh, activities and activities that use Japanese, they had a lower, a slower rate of cognitive decline compared to others who are um, in mainstream um, services. So we know that that this is something that's very important, but there's just not a lot available. And there's been a lot of emphasis on evidence-based practices, um, which are really good. We want to make sure that our practices are backed up by evidence, um, but most of those uh, programs are not developed in or for ethnic minority populations. They may not always get tested on the communities that we serve. Um, and there might be a certain level of rigidity. We want to maintain fidelity, of course. Um, but in fact, most of these EVPs can't be used um, as they are for a lot of ethnic minority communities. We need to have the time um, and ability to um, adapt those. So that, um, so that it becomes relevant and more accessible uh, and gives the same protective factors for our, the communities that we serve. So when we're serving Asian American elders, and you know, a lot of this so far is not so dementia specific. Um, it's something that's true for Asian Americans who, you know, in order to serve Asian American seniors in general. Um, but providing in-language support is one of the most important things um, because it increases understanding and comprehension, communication, and that's especially important when working with somebody um, who may have some cognitive decline. Um, it promotes a sense of inclusion. They feel like they're welcomed. Um, they feel like this service is for them rather than um, feeling alienated or othered by it. Um, and it also helps the person to speak more freely. Um, we've had instances where we might call adult protective services to go check on a person who has some cognitive issues um, and they speak a couple of words of English and the APS worker says, oh, they seem fine. But actually, if we speak to them in their language, like if I talk to them in Japanese, they might share more about their struggles and things like that, where they may not have the words to share what's going on in English. Um, I think one other thing to be very careful when providing um, in language support is to not immediately assume that a family member or 
a neighbor or somebody from church can be the translator. It's important to have a, um, you know, when, as much as possible, professional or third party translator, because it's very hard to ask the senior to talk about some of these really um, things they might feel are shameful in front of, say, their children or grandchildren, or, you know, some of these ethnic communities are very small. When you have the pastor translating, you can't help but wonder, like, will everybody in my congregation be hearing about this tomorrow? Uh, so then it makes it very hard for the person to speak freely. Another reason why in-language support is very important with um, those with ADRD is we've been seeing um, that some, in some cases, that people regress to their primary language or their first language as their, you know, cognitive um, issues increase. And so we find that uh, where they may have been able to communicate with their American-born family um, or caregivers or care or um, service providers in the past, that becomes increasingly difficult. And so assessing that language and level of acculturation of the family members is very important as well. Um, we want to take into account that in a lot of Asian cultures, um, in Japanese and Korean, um, there may be an indirect communication style. Actually, Japanese probably has a much more indirect communication style than, say, Korean or Chinese even, um, where somebody might nod and say yes out of deference to authority to you as a social service provider when in fact they're thinking, mm, I'm not so sure I can follow through with this thing that we're talking about. Um, and then another big issue is, um, is to think about the goal of uh, independence. I think a lot of times for us in America, we're thinking about uh, getting somebody to a point of independence where they can live on their own or continue to live on their own. And that may not always be the goal in Asian American families. The goal might be a restoration of the family connections, and that might be what we as service providers need to focus on. So a word about translations. Um, I want to just point out literal translations often don't make practical sense. We want to have things in multiple languages and translated but sometimes professional translators aren't familiar with the specific terminology, and that might be especially true with Alzheimer's. There are some words or concepts that might be just completely absent in some languages. So even the word dementia, as we were trying to translate this, um, you know, we found that the most commonly used in Korean is based on the word crazy, which we do not want to use that when we're talking about dementia. So, you know, it might be that we need to find um, different words uh, to describe these things. Um, and then, you know, there are times when a technical term might be correct, uh, but is inappropriate for the target population. So there is a word in Japanese for caregiver, but it usually implies that the person is a paid caregiver. And the things that family members do and they might be doing the exact same thing as a paid caregiver, but they would never ever use that term to describe what they are doing. So we have to think about how we're going to communicate some of this information to our families. Um, and there are very specific things, um, you know, about, you know, in the U.S. we think of I statements as empowering, but um, that is not necessarily the case uh, in Asian cultures. And we, when we translate things, we really hope to make things bilingual because maybe the second and third generations born in the U.S. might not be able to read um, in that language. And if we have side-by-side -side language materials, then um, that makes it more accessible for the whole family to participate. So how do we move from this feeling like this to feeling more like this? So very quickly, uh, our uh, ACL-funded Alzheimer's and Dementia Program Initiative um, grant is, for, is titled Enhancing Dementia Capability in the Los Angeles Area um, API Community. We use API as a shorthand um, because, you know, it's hard to name every single different thing, but I want to acknowledge that a lot of times API is used when we really only mean Asian American and Pacific Islander is kind of um, an afterthought. So I really think PIs need to have their own programs and projects. So 
for this presentation, we're sticking with Asian American um, because that is in fact more what we're doing in our adaptation. Our, our English language services, of course, um, include uh, any Asian and Pacific Islander. Um, Little Tokyo Service Center is a lead agency, primarily focusing on Japanese and Korean services, but we're working with Alzheimer's Los Angeles, which is focusing on English and Mandarin. Of course, we're all working together on all the languages. And we have an evaluator, Kyung Hee Chi, um, uh, who is at, the, at Texas State University. Um, and so what we had hoped to see with this is really focusing on um, developing useful vocabulary and developing resources that would then reduce stigma in our respective communities, um, create more supportive activities, increase our dementia capability, and ultimately encourage families to seek support sooner. Because what we're seeing is because of that shame, because they don't know about services, um, people might really delay getting help. Um, and by the time they they are looking for help, maybe the person with dementia is not able to, may not have the capacity to give consent or develop a um, advanced health care directive and things like that. So we really, really are hoping to uh, see people um, come in and ask for services sooner. Um, so, so I should say, you know, we, we don't have a lot of data yet. We've done um, a bunch of presentations and and more than 100 respondents who have, we've seen like a 15% increase in um, people saying they've, they feel more uh, confident about being able to identify symptoms of dementia. And um, you know, we see that we're heading in the right direction, but we're still early in our um, services. So we hope to be able to share data in the future, maybe at an ASA conference. Um, so a lot of the approaches that I, you know, are that uh, I have on these slides, I think they're things that are um, true for any ethnic community. Um, but building a rapport is extremely important when serving Asian Americans. Um, and again, developing a, maybe what you might feel is sort of too euphemistic, but a vocabulary that emphasizes education and wellness rather than receiving help. Um, so there might be Things like we use the term support group um, in English, but you know sometimes in Asian language we might translate that to or explain it as it's a monthly class to learn about. So the empowering part is that you're gaining some knowledge rather than going to a quote unquote support group, or even a term like counseling. Um, you know we say, would you like to talk to a person who's trained to listen? Um, as opposed to saying, you know, we really suggest counseling or therapy. Um, and of course, following up, um, you know, it's important to build that trust. Um, and another thing I really want to highlight is to leave room for reciprocity. Um, for a lot of Asian cultures, the, it's hard to ask for help if you're always receiving and you aren't able to give something back as well. Um, so I think that part can be used to help motivate change. And when you want change, it's important probably to focus on changing behavior, not the thinking or the feelings first. Um, it is much easier for a lot of our seniors to talk about what they can do to address the dementia and make some changes um, and to start doing some activities together. And then from that point on, maybe be able to talk about some of the insecurities they feel. Um, so the main thing, even though I've talked about the Asian American, uh, certain Asian American populations and um, certain cultural points, the main thing really is that the client is the expert. When they came to the U.S., they might have chosen to leave um, certain cultural practices behind or have integrated, and therefore, um, you know, they, they, you know, they will tell you what they need and don't need. And it's very important to just sit and listen. So there are some additional references and resources you can have when you download um, the slides. But again, the contact information for LTSC and our partner agency, Alzheimer's LA, and then the link to um, the report um, from Asian Americans Advancing Justice, which has a whole series of demographic reports by Asian Americans if you're interested. Thank you.
I'll hand it over to Sarah. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us um, in this webinar. Um, I just wanted to take a minute to actually thank uh, ACL and ADRC and ASA for this opportunity to um, present on the Persian uh, American communities. Um, we were really grateful for this grant because, um, as Amy mentioned, uh, in our communities, we were never able to um, access any resources, and uh, not any resources in uh, Farsi existed in the Persian community. So uh, we basically became a pioneer um, for this uh, type of work with dementia care. Uh, just briefly, I wanted to let you know who Omid is. Uh, Omid started in 2011. We're fairly new as a uh, nonprofit organization that primarily was providing mental health services to the underserved community. Uh, but soon after, uh, we actually saw the need um, for a lot of social services, community programs, especially with the aging population. Um, Omid has done many um, services for the senior community. Um, as I mentioned, the Positive Aging Program uh, existed for us. The early intervention services for older adults that are isolated um, is another grant that we have been working with the um, County of Orange. We are located in Orange County, California. Uh, the objective for this presentation in specific will be that um, you will learn who the Persian Americans are, guidelines for culturally sensitive services delivery and why it matters in dementia care, adaptation of culturally appropriate resource material process and um, how we came about that, and uh, lastly success and challenges uh, with providing services in a specific dementia care um, to this population. Um, the name of our ACL project is Orange County Initiative to support special populations impacted by Alzheimer's disease. Uh, this special population was uh, Persian communities and Latinx communities, but for the sake of this presentation, we're sticking to the Persian community. Our partner organization in the project is Alzheimer of Orange County, uh, but mainly providing education, training to five of um, OMID staff over the past two years. Uh, it's a three-year project, and we're right now in the second year of our project. Um, and in this project, we had an aim of um, serving four categories. So the first category um, that we were serving, um, are serving, is a person living with dementia uh, that are alone or at risk. Our outcome goal for this population um, was to enroll and serve about 40 individuals. Um, with the goal of improving the quality of life of the vulnerable target population. The second category that we are serving are the caregivers, um, in specific uh, Persian caregivers, and our outcome goal was to increase caregiver skills, improve level of care, and also um, reduce uh, of burden and stress uh, in the caregiver category. Uh, the third population um, was the gatekeepers and the culturally based organizations that we wanted to train. We had a goal of 10 organizations to train. Usually these are the people that come in contact first with the at-risk population. Uh, and we mainly wanted to train the gatekeepers to basically recognize signs and symptoms of early memory loss and uh, possibly dementia and refer to us. Uh, and Alzheimer's Orange County for further assessment. And the last category was the community at large. Um, at only we really believe in um, educating the public, um, providing free classes, free psychoeducational classes to basically increase in dementia-capable communities. Um, and in order to do that, we basically provided a lot of free dementia friends education, um, a lot of brain health education, um, and so on. Now, I just want to talk about a little bit why culture um, is so important, uh, whether we're dealing with any type of health issue, mental health issue, and a specific dementia care. 
culture usually shapes how healthcare information is received, how symptoms and concern about the problem are expressed, how rights and protections are exercised, who should provide treatment for the problem, and what is considered to be a health problem then what type of treatment should be given. An example I can use um, very easily here for you is that if you're working with um, dementia and dementia care, um, we all know that it's already hard to try to explain that dementia is not a normal um, part of aging. Now, with our population, it's actually kind of harder because um, it's just uh, traditionally and culturally Persians um, have been said in their ways that, you know, as we age, we lose our memory. So this is why I little, um, I had these little bullet points for you and um, what culture really means. So, and why is it so important in dementia care? When we speak about culture, I want to emphasize that culture refers to an integrated pattern of human behavior that includes language, thoughts, communications, actions, customs, beliefs, values, and in general, an institution of racial, ethnic, religious, um, and social groups. So as Amy mentioned, um, it's really important to understand that cultural competency or being culturally responsive um, is just really more than being um, linguistically competent. Um, I have experience of working with a lot of mainstream organizations in South Orange County that they think they can basically hire a Farsi speaking um, care manager and then at that point their organization is now culturally competent. Um, so this is why I just put all the um, definition of culture in here for you and um, why it really does matter when we're thinking about beliefs, values, customs, um, and religion in this population. I just want to briefly tell you about who Persian um, Americans are. The word Persian Iranian uh, is basically the same. It's just the two words are used interchangeably. So if you hear Persian or Iranian, um, we are the same. Uh, Persians or Iranians are specifically from Iran. Uh, I say this with a little emphasis because um, usually when we're talking about the Middle Eastern population, uh, the minute that you have a client coming into your office and uh, they say I'm Persian and you ask them, well, what country are you from? Uh, they're all from Iran. Um, now they do speak other languages. There has been an estimate that about 300,000 to a million uh, Persian Americans are in the United States. Uh, as you can see, there's a huge discrepancy between this number, and that's huge, because up until 2020, uh, Iranian American did not even exist as a checkbox on the U.S. Census. So we're seeing an increase of people reporting themselves and their ethnicities on there. Um, there's an estimate about 160,000 Iranians in California. And I just briefly want to tell you about um, the history of immigration, and I'll explain why this matters in the next slides uh, in terms of providing care to this population. Um, so for the sake of this presentation, obviously we don't want to overgeneralize, but we have um, divided the Persian immigrants into three categories. So there's a category of Iranians that basically immigrated to the United States after the post-1979 revolution. These are very highly educated um, individuals. They were university professors. They were elite groups. They're more affluent um, in terms of socioeconomic status. Then from 1980 to 2001, during the Iran-Iraq War, whoever else could get out of Iran did. So these people also have a lot of resources. Now, from 2001 to present, there have been a lot of lottery recipients, and these are the population that, to us, are considered hard to reach and underserved. Um, so compared to the other two previous groups, uh, they are 
basically more at need. They are not as highly educated. Um, like I said, we're not overgeneralizing, but for the sake of this presentation, we put in these three categories. But in general, um, Iranians or Persians are very highly educated ethnic group. They also have a really high intra-group diversity. What I mean by that is that you will see in um, America that there are Persians that are Muslim, there are Persians that are Jewish, there are Persians that are Christian, they're Ossian. In terms of language, the main language that uh, Persians speak is Farsi. However, there could be Persians that speak Armenian, Turkish, Kurdish, and so on and so forth. So when working with a client that comes to your office, if you are a mainstream um, organization or a community-based organization, it would be really um, important to kind of not assume. Um, always go in with um, an open mind, ask them what they practice, who they are, when did they come to America, what is the history of immigration, because all of that matters. I just have a quick little slide that shows you compared to other, um, all other immigrants, uh, the age group of the 65 and over, which we consider older adults and seniors, in Iranian Americans is actually higher than all the other, whether U.S. born or all the other immigrants, so that's why um, we really felt the need that this project would definitely benefit this group. Um, in terms of their acculturation, uh, the reason I want to talk about this slide is that it really matters when you're trying to provide services to know when they immigrated. If they immigrated, uh, you know, at least 20 years ago, um, they're, like I said, mostly educated, proficient in English. Um, they're, you know, doctors, lawyers, engineers. They're middle, upper class, affluent. And they're not specifically religious, but they do have secular spiritual beliefs. And they have also integrated traditional and more um, modern values, and they're more bicultural. Now, if they've immigrated more recently, um, I would say less than 10 years, um, or their age at the time of immigration was more than 25, they usually have no to little English proficiency. They're mostly mo uh, monolingual. They're in the service industry, small business, or much more religious, maybe practicing Muslims, and they have a lot more traditional values. Uh, but nonetheless, um, for all these uh, categories that I mentioned, they are highly, highly family oriented. Um, they, in terms of seeking services, um, shaming one's family or keeping a faith um, is very common. They don't ask for help. They don't um, come forward with help. And that brings us to service delivery issues and barriers to care, and in specific when it comes to dementia care. So when we're talking about barriers, um, accessibility to care is huge because sometimes they don't even know exists. Like I said, um, dementia resources did not exist in Farsi at all in the United States. When we were trying to come about this project, I honestly reached out to different countries, London, Australia, Canada, um, to be able to find resource material. So that's how we ended up um, actually getting all of Alzheimer OC's training, and we're really grateful for them. They so graciously shared everything with us, and we were able to basically go ahead and translate a lot of material that um, just did not exist uh, before. Um, in terms of dementia assessment, like I said, there was nothing in Farsi, so any dementia assessment tools that they were, um, we had to translate in terms of language and communication. Um, they're not very proficient in English. There's mistrust of the government agencies. Um, and by this, I just mean they have received information that they, if they um, ask for help or receive any kind of governmental benefits, such as like Medicare or Medi-Cal, they might not be able to obtain a green card or become a citizen. So that's what I mean by the mistrust, um, that they feel like, oh, if I get services, then I'm not going to be eligible um, for my citizenship or become a permanent resident. And there's a lack of knowledge. Um, there uh, is a lack of finance, financial resources. Um, we already talked about the acculturation, and then we come to stigma. 
So stigma is huge, and um, by huge, I mean uh, this could take another whole webinar for me. Um, but um, what I wanted to say is that when we talk of stigma, um, we're also talking about a lack of education and information that contributes to isolation and co-socialization. Um, so the consideration for service delivery is that we um, at OMID started um, outreaching to all of the community culturally based organizations in Orange County that we either previously had a relationship with or um, we were working with. Also stakeholders and mainstream organizations. This was extremely beneficial because now they know that there is a Farsi um, speaking, Farsi existing program that they can refer people to. Um, in terms of service delivery consideration with participants and their family, it's really, really important to develop rapport. Um, trust is built very, very slowly with this population, as I mentioned, um, for the uh, mistrust that they have or other um, areas that they have faced. Um, confidentiality and boundary issues are important because um, you want to review that with them, that everything is confidential. Like if you are getting dementia care, of course, it's free of service at our office and we're not really reporting it to anyone so you wouldn't be losing any benefits um, or you wouldn't be straight from getting any benefits in the future. In terms of culturally sensitive assessment, um, it involves that immigration history again. You want to know if they have a support system in America, um, you want to know their family dynamics, how many caregivers are actually providing care. You know, a, a member comes to you and um, complains about maybe early memory loss, and then there's uh, three caregivers with her. So you want to kind of um, make sure that you are um, not necessarily assigning a specific caregiver, but you want to make boundaries and um, these type of stuff very clear for them. For the adaptation of appropriate resource material, we spend a lot of time on this um, because we wanted to make sure that it served both of the populations that I discussed, whether they were recently immigrated or if they had immigrated long ago, more than 25 years ago. Um, we wanted to make sure that our resource material basically was um, kind of streamlined so that any Persian can take it, hand out, and understand what are we talking about? We wanted to make it not too hard, not too easy. And then the cultural expectations, which also include legal and financial. Um, in terms of the cultural expectations in service delivery, we wanted to provide education so that they can gain insight through psychoeducation. We wanted to teach them a skill on how to manage symptoms for both person living with dementia and their caregivers, caregivers so that they can make informed decision, um, gain knowledge of the disease and acceptance, and validation of actions and feelings. And what I mean by that is that there were some studies in Sweden, London, and Australia that um, even though the participant actually accepted that they might have dementia, that they might have um, early stage um, Alzheimer disease or whatnot, uh, it was really hard for the caregivers to accept it, usually because um, caregivers, like I mentioned, they're also highly educated doctors and um, they kind of want to argue with you that are you sure that my mom has this? Are you sure my dad has this? So we had to work, um, you know, from the mental health point of view to kind of um, gain that acceptance and at the same time validate their um, actions and feelings. So what has worked for us in terms of providing services to this population was that um, we soon realized that uh, provider credentials really, really matters to this population. So uh, if an intern comes and puts a lecture up, um, it doesn't have the same effect as if a doctor or an MFT or a PhD comes and give a lecture. So at OMID, we um, hired highly educated care managers. These are PhD either students or MFT students. Um, we have doctors that have taught in other countries, they're university professors in Iran that moved here, but they're not licensed. So um, we basically hired those. 
uh, in translation, we both used both post-revolution and pre-revolution language. So um, that uh, basically, like I said, anybody can take a handout and take a look at those. Um, for um, other things that we did, we tailored the program to fit um, our already existing uh, models. We used the ADH, which was non-threatening. We used MOCA in cognitive screening. And then we got rid of some of the pictures, such as firearm, that didn't make um, sense to our community. So we were um, having lectures, and somebody said, well, why are there a picture of firearm there? So we basically got rid of things, small changes that had a big impact and um, replaced that with a stove. Um, we were able to train 13 gatekeepers. Um, we were able to train 84 staff. We were able to provide 55 cognitive screening in a matter of um, six months. We enrolled 14 people in our um, dementia care coordination, and we trained 18 um, caregivers. And we also provided 115 individuals with education. Um, and my last two slides is something that's a take home, and you can actually take a look at this. But I just um, wanted to wrap this up by saying that culturally informed and responsive care is a worldview and not a skill set. Um, immigrants from the Middle East are very diverse, so just get to know them, um, be curious, play Colombo, ask them, because each Persian American is a unique window to their own culture and a cross-section of multiple identities. And um, cultural adaptation of resource material and being culturally competent on more than just linguistic competency. Um, for the sake of time, I'm wrapping this up, but if you guys have any questions, all of our information is at the end of my slide, and we will be happy to um, be of assistance and help to any organization that would like to learn more about this. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah and Amy, for your wonderful presentations. Both were very informative. Um, and you'll see that you're able to download the slides um, on the platform you're looking at. Uh, we have a few minutes for questions. I want to point out that um, at the time we submitted these slides, there was a coming soon notice for a new um, application for the ADPI program that is now up on grants.gov. You can take a look at that and search for Alzheimer's Disease Programs Initiative. And I just wanted to ask you both, um, well, this question came in for Amy. If religious beliefs were a barrier, have been a barrier, especially for anyone who doesn't speak English with your program. Now, I want to move away from thinking about the religious beliefs or cultural background as, as a barrier as much as it is like we have to shift our tool from the hammer to the screwdriver. Um, so, you know, there, there are differences, different approaches that we um, had to be we took on um, depending on a person's background. Um, but we, we have, I think just like Sarah was saying, that we should have that mindset, um, a worldview, um, and think of it as, okay, we, this is something that we as providers can switch tools in order to help you know, uh, provide access to that person. Great, thank you. Sarah, is there anything you wanna add with relation to that question? I actually agree, and I wanted to say, you know, um, with regards to the faith communities, we actually haven't had much of a success. Sometimes it's actually a barrier to care. Um, however, we have seen that with some um, faith communities, actually it helps people to have that faith piece because um, it does help them. Um, we haven't seen it to be a barrier um, for participants, but we've seen it being a barrier um, when trying to outreach to these communities to try to educate them and bring them in for help. Great, thank you so much. So our presenters had so much wonderful information to provide to you today that we don't have much time left. I wanna thank you all for joining us today at the webinar. Please come again on April 21st when we talk about um, dementia Education for Building Management in the City of Chicago, where they are supporting people living with dementia where they live. So we hope to have you at that webinar as well. I will turn it back to ASA for some final remarks. 
Yes, thank you all again so much for joining us. Thank you to the Alzheimer's and Dementia Resource Center for your partnership and to our presenters today for the information that you provided. Just as a reminder, if you, again, if you would like to claim CEUs for today's webinar, you will be receiving a follow-up email by the end of the business day today that will contain a CEU link application. Um, and you have 60 days to complete that application, and then it may take up to 30 days for us to issue those CEUs. Thank you all again so much. Please be sure to check the ASA website to find out information about upcoming webinars, and we are very grateful. Have a great day.